Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to my movie vlog. My name is John Campia, and this is a special video that's kind of a companion video to an episode of the John Campia show that I did last week. Now, here's what happened last week. I was on vacation. I got really sick, and I was trying to do the John Campia show anyway. I've still got my cough. Don't get me wrong. I still got my cough, so you're going to see me hack and wheeze a little bit throughout this show because I saw... I, I think I got like a bronchitis, which means that the cough is probably going to be with me for a couple more weeks. At any rate, um, so I had to cut my show short last week, and I told people I would get around to making a separate video, and I was too sick to do it, but I'm well enough to do it now. So this is a video that's following up on all the Super Chat questions that got sent in to me from you guys, my viewers, that I couldn't get around to last week, and I'm making good on it now. So that's what we're doing here today. So let's get started with the first question that came in here. And you're going to notice I have an answer written because originally when I realized I wasn't going to be able to make another video because I was just too sick, I thought, well, you know what I'll do? I'll take those Super Chat questions. <coughs> Pardon me. And I'll write out answers to them and I'll post those online. So I wrote out answers, but I thought, no, you know what? They deserve me to do a video about it. But I still thought I'd leave in these answers just so you can see what my initial responses were. So let's get started here. The first question comes to us from Jano 89 who writes, Hey John, love your content. Thank you so much. Are they holding off on Battleship Yamato? Waiting to see how Alita Battle Angel does. Thanks and bring on the filthy. Now my initial answer, which you can see was, no, I don't think so. Space Battleship Yamato Star Blazers is as different from Alita Battle Angel as Snow White is from Silence of the Lambs. The projects have almost no similarities. And for those of you who don't know what he's talking about, Space Battleship Yamato, also known as Star Blazers in North America, was an anime <clears throat> from like the 80s and 90s. That's probably my favorite of all time. And it's about the Earth is being attacked and they basically dig up the old Japanese battleship Yamato and retrofit it into a space battleship. And it's amazing. Anyway, so the question he's asking is, hey, do we think they could be holding off on it? Because like, where the hell is this live action adaptation in North America? To see how Alita Battle Angel does. And I don't think so whatsoever. The two projects have nothing in, uh, in common. They have no similarities whatsoever. So no, I, I don't think whatever is holding up a space battleship Yamato movie, it's not sitting around waiting to see how Alita Battle Angel does. I, I don't think that has anything to do with it, to be honest with you. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question comes to us from Velushkin, who writes, John, would you ever figure out a way to play Magic the Gathering with viewers? <coughs> and you can see the answer I put in there was, no, I don't think so. Probably less than 5% of my audience play, and doing so virtually over video doesn't sound like much fun to me. So, yeah, I enjoy playing Magic the Gathering. Ann and I play. Uh, I've been playing for a lot of years. Then I didn't play for a whole bunch of years, and then about two years ago I started playing again. But uh, to, to play, like, with viewers, I, I really don't see how that would be interesting to the rest of my viewers. And I don't really see how mechanically you can actually make it happen or do it right. So, honestly, it doesn't sound that appealing to me, so I probably wouldn't do that. Uh, the next one comes to us from Anthony R. And Anthony R. writes, Hey, John, I know I'm nitpicking, but hearing the words Godspeed and Big Ass Door felt out of place in The Last Jedi and in Star Wars in general. And as you can see, my response was, it worked for me. I really don't see the problem. Um understanding that in the universe of Star Wars, different cultures have gods. So her saying God's speed makes no big deal and saying big ass door, not a big deal to me. I mean, look, anything in Star Wars or Star Trek or anything science fiction-y has the potential to feel out of place whenever you do anything. And if those things felt out of place to you, then they felt out of place to you. I can't relate because I thought they worked in there just fine for me, but they didn't work for you, so they didn't work for you. That's cool. Uh, let's see. Hussick writes, <coughs> Love Steven Spielberg, but why is he the best for you? I've kind of explained this a hundred times, but the answer I wrote was, I sort of answered that a hundred times, 
Basically, no director in history has shown the diversity and scope he has. From sci-fi, comedy, animated, thriller, period piece, biographical, action, drama, you name it, he's done it. And that really sums it up to me. No director ever in history has shown the scope of storytelling ability that, that Steven Spielberg has with the consistent level of excellence that Steven Spielberg has. And like not a Scorsese, not Francis Ford Coppola, not even Hitchcock has done the sheer diversity of types of movies that Steven Spielberg has. Like nobody's come close. So to me, that just puts Steven Spielberg head and shoulders above everybody else, in my personal opinion. All right, thanks a lot for the question. Next one comes to us from Vin Joy. And Vin Joy writes, You liked that Ghostbusters remake released in 2016. But John, now that some time has passed, do you still think it's a good movie? Please say no. Thanks and put some pants on. And here's my answer. Yes, I still stand by it. It's a funny movie. I have several major issues with it, and it's certainly not as good as the original in any way, but it made me laugh many times, and I left the theater entertained. I honestly feel that people, a lot of people, decided they didn't like it even before seeing it. I stand by that. Look, I know the popular, cool, the cool thing to do is to say how bad and how much you didn't like Ghostbusters. I get it. That's the cool thing to do. But I just got to call it as I see it. I saw Ghostbusters, and if you saw my review of the Ghostbusters remake, you know I have several issues with the film, several big issues with the film. But at the end of the day, for me, a lot of the comedy in the movie worked, and I laughed. And I laughed enough that by the time the end credits rolled and I left the theater, I could honestly look in the mirror and say, I have been entertained. And that's the bottom line. Now, I know there's a bunch of people that they saw in the movie, and it didn't work for them. That's cool. Nothing wrong with that. <clears throat> However, I also do think there are some people out there who just claim they don't like the movie because they have their own political agenda when it comes to it. Or the trailers were so bad, and let's call it what it is. That first Ghostbusters trailer is one of the worst trailers ever made in history. Like, ever. And I think a lot of people, understandably, kind of pre-decided that this movie was going to suck. And they just decided it was more important to stick to their guns and say it sucked. than whatever. But, you know, whatever. If you're somebody who saw the movie and it just didn't work for you, that's great. If you're somebody who just decided it didn't work for you, whatever, your reasons are your own. But I have to be honest. And I know it's not the popular thing to say, but I've never been about saying the popular thing. I'm about saying my honest opinion. My honest opinion is, I watched the Ghostbusters movie, made me laugh. Is it great? No. Did I watch it five more times? No. Am I still going to be talking about it two years from now? No. But overall, it worked for me, made me giggle, made me laugh, so I'm not going to stop saying it. No matter how unpopular it is to say, I'm going to keep saying it, because it worked for me. And if you can't deal with that, that's your problem. But like I said, it worked for me. Uh, let's see. Reggie Phoenix writes, Better ensemble, Runaways or The Gifted? My initial answer I wrote was, it's close, but I'll say The Gifted. I'll stick with that answer for now. These are two shows, The Gifted and Runaways, that I admit, I didn't think either of them was going to work. To be completely blunt with you, I didn't think either of, these film, or the, either of these new shows would really work. But they have both won me over. I enjoy them both a great deal. And as far as which is the better ensemble, <clears throat> like I said in that initial answer, it's close for me. It's still close, but I will still lean towards the gifted. Not, that's not taking anything away from the great ensemble cast of those kids in Runaways. Not at all. But I have to give the edge to, uh, to gifted. All right. Next question comes to us from Anthony R. who writes, With the original trilogy cast practically gone, do you suspect Chewbacca dying or C-3PO and R2-D2 being destroyed or even the Falcon destroyed? Eh, nah, not really. I Number one, I don't see a dramatic purpose for it happening. Number two, you could do it just as a repercussion of war, much like the way Admiral Akbar dies. Like, Admiral Akbar just goes out <clears throat> in a way that people would just go out. It's just in the middle of an act of war and he dies. And it was without fanfare and all that kind of stuff. Maybe something like that could happen to Chewbacca. Maybe something like that could happen to R2 or 3PO. 
Or maybe something like that could help to the Falcon. I mean, the Falcon's an old ship, but I don't think there's any need for Star Wars to make sure in every movie somebody significant has to die. I don't think there's a need to do that. If they do it, great, but I don't think there's this compelling reason to do it. So, right now, still two years removed from Episode Nine. I'm going to go ahead and guess no. I don't think Chewbacca or R2 or 3 PO will be destroyed, or the Falcon. So that's just my guess. All right. Josh Baker writes, What movie trailers will we see on the Super Bowl? And my answer that I wrote down is still the same. I have no idea. No idea. I haven't heard anything. I haven't heard any whispers. I've seen no rumors. <coughs> so at this point, I'm just going to have to stick with that. Your guess right now as to which trailers we could see, completely as good as mine. I think a lot of studios are questioning the value of playing your, your trailer at the Super Bowl, considering how expensive it is. You're talking about millions of dollars per minute. Millions and millions of dollars for one spot. And I think a lot of studios are questioning the wisdom of doing that. Yeah, there's a big audience, but it's a one-time shot and you're paying big, big money. Could you get more exposure for that same money exhibiting your, your marketing somewhere else. Spread across more time or something like that. That's something they can ask themselves. So, but at this point, I have no idea. Now, uh, let's see. Manuel Fernandez writes, I feel like people take a bit far... <coughs> pardon me, let's try this again. I feel like people take it a bit too far when they say, movie theaters will go extinct and there won't be any left. At their current rate, what do you think is the likeliest outcome if nothing is done? The answer I wrote, if they don't start addressing some of these serious issues, 15 years from now, the movie theater experience could be gone. Now, look, I'm not saying that's what will happen. But right now, what is indisputable is that movie theater attendance is on the decline. Notice I didn't say box office money is on the decline. They're making big money at the box office. But the number of people actually going out to the theater and buying tickets, that's on the decline. <coughs> and it's been on the decline for a while. And unless the, the movie studios themselves and the movie theater industry start taking some serious steps to stop trying to figure out ways to make more money and start figuring out ways to get people coming back to the theaters, and I think they will address it, but if they don't, if they do nothing... And this can trend continues for another 5, 10, 15 years, then it's not an exaggeration. To say 15 years from now, the movie going experience as we know it could be gone. And I think that would be terrible for the movie industry. Terrible for the movie industry. And terrible for fans. Because nothing beats the movie going experience. Nothing beats it. So I really hope they get off their asses and start figuring these problems out. Um, <clears throat> this next one comes to us from Ben, Ben Rayner, who writes, Game of Thrones has to wait because Gwendolyn Christie is busy getting ready for a solo Phasma movie in the Star Wars universe. And my answer was, and the movie would only be five minutes long since that's about as much as they know what to do with her. That's, I mean, the thing about Phasma, and I know Ben was being facetious in the question, but seriously, what would you do with a standalone Phasma movie? They don't know how to do anything with the character. They did nothing with her in The Force Awakens. They did nothing with her of practical value in The Last Jedi. They simply have no idea what to do with this character. None. No idea at all. So, now there's a pretty interesting novel. There's a Phasma novel out right now that's pretty good. I liked it. But <clears throat> they just seem to have no clue what to do with the character, so... And I know you're being facetious, Ben, but don't hold your breath about any Phasma movie coming anytime soon. All right. Emmanuel Ibanez writes, Howdy, been a fan for years. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. Uh, what are your thoughts on the theory that Luke was planning on jumping off the cliff to take his last step as a Jedi in The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi? My answer, absolutely stupid. It's a ridiculous, nonsensical, moronic theory. I mean, theories are belly buttons. Everybody has one. Uh, so that's fine that you have a theory. But I will tell you what your theory is. The theory is stupid. It's a dumb theory. So I would say, Emmanuel, don't listen to that theory. It's absolutely nonsense. Uh, let's see. Justin Welsh writes, Welcome back. Thank you so much, Justin. 
Other day rewatched Logan. Ending equals man tears. What movies make you sob? Uh, others include most Pixar, uh, It's a Wonderful Life, and Marley and Me. And, and to me, <clears throat> what I wrote in my answer there, it still stands true. It's the Italian film by director Roberto Bonini, who also starred in the film called Life is Beautiful. That movie, I'm put, I don't put out many guarantees. I guarantee it will make you cry. At the very minimum, it'll get you choked up and you'll have some tears starting to well in your eyes. I've never had a movie that can more powerfully move me to tears like Life is Beautiful. It's insane. And it's not just manipulative either. I mean, it's pure, real beauty and emotion. And that's what it elicits out of you. And that's the beautiful thing about the film. I know most of you guys have still not seen it. But when you get the chance, it has subtitles, yes. But sit down and watch. Life is beautiful. It won a couple of Oscars. It's fantastic. It's wonderful. Check it out. Uh, let's move on now. James Dezeal, who writes, As of now, Abe Sapien hasn't been publicly cast for Hellboy reboot. Do you think that they are waiting to put him in a sequel to avoid comparisons? Why would they? I mean, well, my answer is no, absolutely not. But really, why would they? If you're not going to hold off on doing a Hellboy movie out of fear of comparisons from one Hellboy to the next, why would they be afraid of comparisons with their secondary sidekick character? All, no disrespect intended to Doug Jones or whoever plays Abe Sapien in the future. <clears throat> but if you're not worried about comparisons with your lead character, why would they be worried about comparisons with their sidekick character? So, no, I do not believe there, that waiting to make sure there's no comparisons, I have no doubt that has nothing to do with it whatsoever. Very, very little doubt about that at all. All right, thanks a lot for the question, man. All right, we move on now to the next one. My Opinions writes... How do you know when a movie is well-directed? Uh, the answer I wrote out, well, you look at the performances, you look at the pace of the film, the narrative flow, lots of different things. Look, there's, there's, there's no formula to what makes a good movie. There's no formula to what makes a good directing um, effort. But as an audience member myself, some of the things that I look for are, were the performances out of each individual character and actor heightened and were they made to blend well with each other i look to see does the movie have a cadence to it <coughs> that's one of the biggest challenges of any director is giving their film not a fast pace but a deliberate cadence and i find the best directors are the ones who give a real sense of cadence to their films also the narrative flow does the story just feel like it naturally flows like, it doesn't feel forced. It doesn't feel like we're being forced to follow road signs, but rather there's a natural flow to the story that just unveils itself as you move along the, the, the movie in a progressive way. So performances, cadence, narrative flow. Those are the three things that I personally, as a, and like I said, there's no one formula that makes it right or wrong. But for me as an audience member, those are the key ingredients I look for and the things that stand out to me that make me go, wow, this film was well-directed. If those things are there, <coughs> to me, it was a well-directed film. All right. Thanks a lot for the question, man. Uh, we move on to the next one. SSXNV writes, how does a first look deal benefit Matt Reeves? And this comes from a story last week where Matt Reeves has signed on um, to a first look deal with Netflix. That means any new idea that he or his production company come up with for a movie the first people he has to go to with it is Netflix. They get the first look at any new ideas he has, and they get the right of first refusal on any new movies. So the question is, how does that benefit somebody like Matt Reeves? You can see from my answer, with money. With big money. See, here's the thing. If you're a filmmaker like Matt Reeves, you just don't sign a first look deal for no reason. Like, you don't just say, Oh, Netflix, you want to have right of first refusal on my movies? Okay, and just sign it. No, 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 no. Netflix has to come to him and say, and I don't know what the monetary value of the deal is, but as an example, Netflix has to go to him and say, look, we're going to cut you a check for $10 million. Or, <coughs> pardon me, 
We're going to cut you a check for five million bucks. And in exchange for this five million bucks, over the next four years, three years, five years, whatever, any new concept ideas that you have, you have to come to us first and we get the first dibs at it. And if we don't want to do it, then you're free to take it and shop it to another studio, but we get first look. And the reason, the advantage for somebody like Matt Reeves is automatic money in his pocket. And if Netflix wants to do his new movie, it's not like he has to let them do it for free. They still have to pay him for it, but they give him money up front for the right of first look. For the right of first refusal, if you will. I've signed, like, I've had two first look deals before. And nothing ever came out of them, but, you know, the, it's the place paid me a certain amount of money, and they get the right to take first crack at, say, a script I was doing specifically, or about anything, some, some grander thing I would do in business. I'm not under any first look deals right now. Um, but, yeah, and actually for a while, the last place that I worked at, uh, part of my contract was a first look deal. That if I came up with ideas for new shows and whatever, that my employer had the first right to develop those into shows, but if for whatever reason they passed on them, then I could take those ideas for shows and shop them to other networks if I wanted to. So the benefit for the creator is money. That's the benefit. All right, thanks a lot for the question. Um, <clears throat> Danny Ward writes, most anticipated film of 2018 is, or my most anticipated film of 2018 is Thoroughbreds. You know, it's funny because Thoroughbreds also came up on the John Campy show earlier today. My answer, I'm really looking forward to that one too. To the best of my knowledge, it's the last film that Anton Yelchin did before he passed away. Um, but, but Anton passed away so, so long ago. That's how long sometimes it takes movies to get from being shot to actually being distributed. But yeah, Anton Yelchin, I believe it's the last film he did. And if you haven't seen the trailers for Thoroughbreds, look him up on YouTube. It looks great. It looks really great. And I'm excited to see it. It's not my most anticipated film of the year, but I'm very excited to see it. The movie looks fantastic. All right, we move on. Anthony C. writes, where do you buy your digital movies? And my answer there, I've mentioned this before, is mostly from the Google Play Store. 90% now of the movies that I buy, and I have, I've done this for a long time. I don't generally buy Blu-rays or DVDs. I buy most of my movies digitally. I like having them available to me wherever I am, whenever I want to watch them. And... I'd say 95% of the digital purchases I make on the Google Play Store. Now, you can get them from iTunes or Amazon, uh, the Amazon streaming service, or what are some of the other, Vudu or whatever else. There's other services out there too. Whatever one works for you is fine. For me, I really like the Google Play Store. That's where I buy most of my digital movies. Uh, let's see. Next one comes to us from Icy Bubba, who writes... You McGregor in Kenobi in 2020? And my answer written down was, that's the question we're all asking right now. And that, that really is the big question. Uh, at the Golden Globes, I remember a bunch of people were buzzing just because Ewan McGregor had a beard. And everybody's going, oh my gosh, is he getting ready to play Obi-Wan? Is that why he has a beard? No, he just has a beard for whatever he's doing right now. But they did ask him about it afterwards on the, um, in the post show. And they were asking him about Obi-Wan. And uh, what he said was really interesting. He just basically said, look, you guys know as much about it as I do right now. There was some preliminary discussions, but really, I don't know anything more about it than what you guys know right now. Now, he's not saying nothing's going to happen. He's not saying that. But he did say, basically, right now, everything is so early in the process, there's really not much to tell. I do believe they will make an Obi-Wan movie. And I do believe it'll have you, McGregor. I can't imagine why you would do it without you, McGregor. So I think they will. Will it come as early as 2020? I don't know. We're in 2018 now. So that means within the year, they'd have to be in production probably. And are they close enough to do that? I'm not sure. If I had to put five bucks down, I'd say yes. Um, but we'll have to see. Maybe it might have to wait till 2021, 2022. Depends on what their plans are right now. All right. We move on. Uh, Sujith Rad. Ha Krishan writes, Hey John, I'm a, I'm a great fan from India. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Would you want to see Patty Jenkins write and direct a Man of Steel sequel 
I read she's the biggest fan of Superman. In my opinion, she can pick up where J.S., I think you mean Z.S., <coughs> where Zack Snyder left off. And my answer, as it is to any question, John, do you think this actor could play this role? John, do you think this director could direct this movie? Is, sure, why not? Whatever. You know, to me, as long as it's a talented director, could they direct that movie? Sure. Is Patty Jenkins a talented director? You're damn right she is. So could she, would I be okay if she directed Man of Steel too? Sure, why not? She's a talented director. But I'm going to give that same answer no matter what the director you mentioned to me is, as long as I think it's a talented director. And Patty Jenkins certainly qualifies, for sure. Um, Richie Fernandez writes, Do you understand the hate that Joss Whedon gets for Justice League? No, I do not. I think Joss Whedon did as well with that movie as anybody could have. Um, everybody who's clamoring for a Zack Snyder cut, it probably would have been worse. <coughs> and I like Justice League. I saw it six times in theaters. I thought he did a good job with it, especially considering all the limitations and constraints that he was under. And the fact that, you know, apparently so Kevin Sujahara could get a bigger bonus. He refused to let them bump it into 2018 which is what I thought would have been better for the movie, but whatever, they didn't. So no, I think Joss Whedon, in the most impossible circumstances, stepped in and salvaged that movie as good as it could be done, and I thought it ended up being a pretty entertaining movie. So that, that's my thought on it. Uh, let's see. Devontae Brown writes, John, finally took a long Uber drive to AMC Dolby Prime and was almost charged an additional $75 cleaning fee on Christmas because a driver falsely accused me. <coughs> That's terrible. That's awful. I love Uber. I've had great experiences with Uber. It sucks that you had that terrible experience, Devante. Really, I'm sorry to hear that. I see. Andy Brake writes, when we top, sorry, when we talk top box office, do you feel adjusting for inflation or ticket sales is not a better metric? Gone with the wind would be an undisputed champion. And here's what I wrote, because I take these questions all the time. People always ask me, why don't we adjust for inflation? And here's what I wrote. Because inflation is just one single variable. You can't just pick and choose one that you want to count. You either have to take all of them into account or take none of them. What do I mean by that? And I've talked about this several times, but... <coughs> is inflation a variable in terms of box office. It absolutely is. It is a variable. But there are other variables. Like, for instance, back when Gone with the Wind came out, 500 wide release movies did not come out a year. It was totally different. It was totally different back then. Do we take that in consideration too? And if you say no, then why are you saying we should take that variable and not that variable? Another variable. Back when Gone with the Wind was coming out, there weren't 400 digital TV networks to compete for entertainment time. Do we take that? Should we take that into consideration when talking about box office? If you say no, why? Why do we take that variable but not this variable? That's a serious, very real variable that has affected the way box office works. Back when Gone with the Wind came out, there weren't video game systems that really strongly compete for people's entertainment money. Do we take that in consideration when talking about adjusting for box office? And if you say no, why? Why should we take inflation as a variable, but not take into consideration the very, very real variable of strong digital competition for entertainment dollar? Back when, you know, Gone with the Wind didn't have to compete against Xboxes and Playstations and Nintendo Switches. Today, those are competitors. Do we take into consideration the proliferation of streaming entertainment services like Netflix and Hulu? If you say no, why not? Why should we take that one, one variable but not this one? See, and when it comes down to it, there are dozens and dozens of variables that make the landscape from, say, when A Gone with the Wind came out in theaters compared to today. There are challenges and difficulties and competitions that today's movie go that today's movie producers have to face that a movie like Gone with the Wind never had to compete against. So, 
you can't just say, let's, let's cherry pick and pick one variable, but ignore all the other ones. You either got to take them all into consideration or you take none of them in consideration and just go, no, we're just going to keep it as pure as possible, pure dollar value. And neither of those answers are perfect. But I think the better option is just to take it straight as it is across the board. Understand that times change. We all know that times change. But, you know, we can't go taking and trying to qualify and calculate every single variable that comes into the argument and the discussion. So just going, well, let's just adjust for inflation. Well, then if you're going to be consistent with that logic, then you got to take into consideration all the other variables, and that's not really practical to do. So no, I don't believe in taking uh, inflation into consideration at all. Not at all. Uh, let's see here. Um, Guzz off my dad, he writes. Vision gonna Gus off in Avengers. That means die. <coughs> And my answer is, ah, it's possible. I'd say no, though. I, Whenever Marvel kind of hints or teases a character dying in a trailer, it usually doesn't happen. And in the trailer for Avengers Infinity War, we see them having Vision pinned down. He's captured. They're about to yank the stone out of his head. Oh, Vision's going to die. But we've seen Marvel do that before. Like with Rhodey, War Machine, falling out of the sky in Civil War trailer. But he doesn't die. So, based on that, I'm going to guess that Vision... It's totally possible. He totally could. But I'm going to guess that he does not die. I'm going to guess he doesn't. All right. Thunder Knight 19 writes, Why is Mission Impossible 6 missing from a lot of the most anticipated films of the 2018 list, despite the franchise getting better and better? My answer that I wrote out is just because there are a lot of great looking movies coming out this year. And that's what it was for me. I'm very much looking forward to Mission Impossible 6. But that movie did not make my most anticipated films of the year list. My top 10 list. Not because I'm not looking forward to Mission Impossible 6. But because there are so many bloody brilliant looking movies coming out in 2018. This year looks stacked as hell. Um... So I wouldn't take it missing off a lot of people's lists as if people weren't looking forward to it. I think everybody's looking forward to Mission Impossible 6, but holy hell, man, there is a lot of good-looking movies coming out this year. That's probably why. The more important question is, at the end of 2018, where does Mission Impossible 6 rank on our best of the year list? That's more important, but we'll just have to wait and see. All right, next one comes to us from Anthony C., who writes... Why did George Lucas insist on directing the prequels, even though he did not direct Empire or Jedi? Was it because of ego or something else? And, and the answer I wrote out is what I stick by, which is he felt he could make the movies he really wanted to make now that the, the technology existed and he really wanted to play with it. And that's the truth. George Lucas finally had the technology to make movies that he wanted to make. And I think he had been looking forward, he had been looking forward to that for decades. So I think when the opportunity finally came for him to take his Star Wars movies to, in his opinion, the next level, he finally had the tools and the toys available to him to make the movies he wanted to make. I don't think it was about ego, I don't think it's about I think it's just about that. Hey, Star Wars is his, and he wanted to make more Star Wars movies, but he's wanted to wait until he had the digital tools to do it the way he wanted to do it. Now, it depends on who you ask. If you ask me, it turned out to be a disaster, but that's why he made those movies himself. And I don't fault him for that. I don't fault him for that at all. <coughs> okay. And the final question of the day comes to us from Micah the Ven... Yam Gam, who writes, War for the Planet of the Apes should have been called Dawn, and Dawn should have been called War, so that the title slash tone would have better fit with each movie, and the answer that I wrote was, uh, not sure I agree, uh, but the last one should not have been called War, there was no war in it, and I stand by that. Calling the last movie, War for the Planet of the Apes was one of the more deceptive marketing campaigns I've seen in a long time. Because that, the campaign for War for the Planet of the Apes made it look like this was going to be a war movie. 
It made it look like this is going to be the movie where we see the epic battle between humanity and apes and blah, blah, blah. And none of that was in the film. Despite what the trailers try to make it look like and all that kind of stuff, none of, there was no war in War for the Planet of the Apes. There was one battle that happened between two fractions of the, e, of the human side. Two human uh, armies going at it. But that was it. So, yeah, I did not... Uh, yeah, hmm. That still st sits bad. Even though I like the movie. The movie's a good movie. It is. It's a good movie. But that has never sat right with me. Like how misleading that entire marketing campaign. And how misleading the title of that movie is. Alright guys, that will do it for this installment of this little video here. Getting you caught up on all those uh, topics you guys sent in. Thanks so much for joining me. Hey listen guys, while you're here, take a second, click on the thumbs up button. Click subscribe, become a subscriber to my YouTube channel. And follow me on social media, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Simply at John Campia. That will do it for me guys. Thanks so much for joining me. My name is John Campia and until my next video, bye bye